right. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of you joining us this evening. And uh, for those who will be watching this uh, later on the recording, thank you for tuning in to watch as well. Uh, we are in week number two of the Kansas Grazing Lands uh, Coalition uh, webinar series uh, around uh, grazing topics. Uh, tonight's speaker is Dale Strickler. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Dale. Uh, tonight, his topic is going to be managing your grazing profit on brome and fescue, uh, which is a pretty cool trick, Dale, if you can teach us all how to do that. Uh, everybody has plenty of brome and plenty of fescue, but not plenty of profit. So I'm going to turn it over to you and you can share with us how to turn that brome and fescue into some good profit. Okay, I'll uh, kick this off. Uh, first thing I need to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition and, and obviously have this mission statement. We're trying to regenerate Kansas grazing lands and uh, uh, have to give the obligatory non-discrimination statement and uh, also have the uh, um, you cannot hear, then we uh, please request uh, an alternative means of communication. So, and uh, disclaimer, uh, the views expressed by me, the presenter, do not reflect the entirety of Kansas Grazing Lands Coalition or the USDA. In other words, uh, what you hear from me is my opinion and my opinion only. So anyhow, um, let me pull up the presentation itself here. Okay, can everybody see the see the presentation? Okay. Yep, we can see it, Dale. Okay, great. Hey, uh, like Keith said, uh, we have. In, uh, particularly in the eastern part of Kansas, we have millions of acres that are in brome or fescue. And unfortunately, most of those acres are money pits. We pour a lot of money into them and don't get a lot of return off of them, unfortunately. And that's a shame because there uh, are some real attributes of cool season grasses like brome and fescue. And uh, I think in part of the state, we have too many acres of cool season grasses, and in most of the rest of the state, we don't have enough. I think there are some real advantages of cool season grasses, if managed correctly, that we can really take advantage of, improve our bottom line in a grazing operation. So um, the biggest issue, both, both benefit and drawback of cool season grasses, I guess you call it a double-edged sword, is the timing of when they grow. Uh, as you can see on, on brome grass here, seasonal production, we get a primary growth per curve in the spring, we get a secondary growth curve in the fall. And if we were to contrast this with a warm season grass, which grows mostly in early summer and to a lesser extent in late summer, um, the cool season grasses green up early, they have a brownout in midsummer and then they start growing again in the fall. So um, we'll talk about how we make use of that. Well, why is that? Well, cool season grasses have a different carbon fixing mechanism than warm season grasses. A grass is either warm season or it's cool season. It's never in between. There's no intermediate. They're completely different methods of photosynthesis. Cool season grasses have what's called a C3 photosynthesis method. And uh, warm season grasses have what's called a C4. Now, um, if you look at this graph, and I, I apologize for the uh, Hungarian language over there at the left, uh, the, the only version of this, I could, this graph I could find was uh, in Hungarian. But if you look at temperature, now, the temperature is in Celsius, of course. So you look at this and you say, whoa, boy, those C4 grasses, they sure are a lot more productive, and they are. 
when it's hot. And um, the peak of that is uh, somewhere in the 90 degree Fahrenheit range, 90 to 95 degree Fahrenheit range. Well, we only pick, spend part of the year in that temperature range. You look over there, um, zero Celsius is 32 Fahrenheit. And you look when you are between um, basically freezing, the freezing point, 32 degrees, and about 60 to 65 Fahrenheit, cool season grasses outgrow warm season grasses. And because in a temperate region, we spend so much of our time, so much of the year under 65 degrees, um, that makes cool season grasses really val valuable for extending the grazing season. And we'll hit on this quite a few times later. Um, one real drawback that C3 plants have is they are less water efficient. And that's why you find fewer and fewer cool season grasses as you go west in Kansas, because um, as you get into drier and drier regions, the cool season grasses tend not to be as competitive. Doesn't mean that they don't have a role in the western part of the state. I think they really do. But we might have to pick and choose that role. They're not going to compete in the middle of summer with warm season grasses. And, and for an example here, uh, this is a stand of uh, tall fescue and red clover, which are both cool season species. The big clumps uh, you see in the back are Johnson grass, which is a warm season grass. And this is the regrowth after taking a hay cutting in June. And you can see that the Johnson grass, the warm season, has grown quite a bit more. And you say, well, gosh, looking at that, I'd like to have all warm season grasses. Well, that's not the greatest idea either. This is uh, April 9th, and you see that green clump of fescue in the background with a background of warm season Bermuda grass. And you see that Bermuda grass is doing nothing at this time. Spring and fall is when cool season grasses really shine. Winter warm season grasses are dormant. And so if I'm gonna compare cool season, warm season grasses and for a number of things, growth at high temperatures, of course, warm season grasses gonna be high, cool season is gonna be low. And by high temperatures, I mean over 90. Um, water efficiency, warm seasons better, cool seasons less, and nitrogen use efficiency. Warm season grasses will yield more per pound of nitrogen than cool season grasses. Um, but the, again, double-edged sword here. Cool season grasses, most of the extra nitrogen that cool season grasses need is because of, because of their physiology, they have a much higher protein content at similar stages of maturity as warm season grasses. They're also more digestible. Uh, the sugar content and the cell walls tend to be lower in lignin and thus the digestibility is higher. So more digestible, higher in protein at similar stages of maturity. And of course, the real value is that they will grow better at low temperatures and uh, gives us the ability to extend the grazing season over warm season grasses alone. Like I said, part of the state needs more cool season grasses. Part of the state could use fewer cool season grasses. And nowhere in the state really are we, by and large, managing either correctly. So uh, one of the drawbacks we talked about cool season grasses that they are very dependent on added nitrogen supply. They need more nitrogen because of the higher protein content. Nitrogen and protein are directly related in the plant. The plant takes up nitrogen for the purpose of building protein. Um, there's four plots here. You see the four white signs in this. Uh, the far left-hand one is zero nitrogen. The second one is 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. The third one is 200 and the far right one is 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre. You can see there is a big difference when you add nitrogen to cool season grasses. Pretty spectacular the difference. And this is just a response crow, 
uh, response curve of brome to added nitrogen. You can see the first uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen, you got an extra over a ton per acre. I mean, the first 50 pounds doubled the brome, more than doubled the brome yield. And for each pound of nitrogen you put out there, you got 44 pounds of feed. That's, that's impressive. An additional 50 pounds of nitrogen, you got you know, 1,400 pounds, still a good response. And then the third increment, going from 100 to 150, see, well, we didn't get that big of a response then. Depending on how valuable the feed is and what it costs to put the fertilizer out there, that's where somewhere um, is the economics of, of value of the feed and the, the cost of the fertilizers when they determine what the economic rate is. And this is just some similar data. You know, this is long-term K-State data and it breaks it down into smaller increments yet, you know, tons per acre versus 20 pounds of nitrogen. And somewhere on this curve, you can find out, given the, again, the value of the feed versus the cost of the fertilizer, where it's most economical. I would argue that um, none of these rates are the most economical option. Um, and this, I apologize for the poor, poor quality of this. This is taken with an old time cell phone about 15 years ago. This is the junction to the right is a plot of orchard grass and to the left is a plot of alfalfa. And you can see there's a little spot where they overlap. You notice how green and more abundant the seed heads are where that orchard grass and the alfalfa overlap, there is a definite nitrogen contribution from legumes to grasses. It's really a, a very synergistic relationship. I think a lot of why, uh, you know, very few of our cool season grasses have good stands of legumes in them. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of our management precludes that. People don't want to have legumes in their pastures. And why is that? Largely, it's because they think they have to spray for weeds. In some cases, you know, if you've got a noxious weed, you may have to control that. But more often than not, weeds, most pasture weeds can be eaten if we change our grazing management. And if we have time at the end, I can show you some slides of that as well. But the fear of weeds has kept us from doing probably the single most profit boosting decision there is in cool, managing cool season grasses. And that is the insertion of legumes into the stand. And uh, so I'll be harping on that quite a little bit and explaining some of the things that we need to do. Uh, in order to maintain, to get the legumes and to maintain the legumes. But um, avoiding herbicide use is probably number one amongst those. Okay, um, I talked about the temperature relationship. Um, cool season grasses simply do not grow very well at all once air temperatures reach over 90 degrees on a consistent basis. That's really, late June through late August, I would say in a typical year, maybe early September. The picture I have here is um, smooth brome. This is in 2016, that's uh, north of Topeka. And this was after uh, 16 inches of rain in July and August that year at this site. I and mean, this is as good as fall growth ever looks on brown in September. I mean, this you say, well, that's that sure is pretty, but um, seriously, folks, it's ankle high, boot top high at best. This is our expectations. What if there is a way to get more out of this brown? And there is. And we have thought, uh, first of all, how many species do you see in 
in this. Start counting, I'm waiting. One, we have one species here. One cool season species. I see you, Dale, you're a second species. What, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, plant yeah. species, how about that? So, um, no, I'm sure there's some chiggers and some other things like that, but there's just one plant species out there. Now, by understanding how and why Rome grows the way it does, we can put that to use. And here's what we did here. We, we drilled in summer annuals. And I say we, uh, the farmer did this. Um, he, uh, he called me up and wanted me to wanted to show me what he was doing. I was thoroughly impressed. So that's why I took these pictures and why I'm still talking about it several years later. But you look at this, I mean, look at that jungle. Uh, the biomass on this was over twice what it was on the previous field. You say, but oh my gosh, all that stuff is gonna choke the brome out and then you're gonna be left with nothing. No, that's, that's not the way it worked. In fact, if you part that, that canopy of the summer annuals, there was actually more brome biomass underneath this than there was out in the open. And why is that? Well, you remember when we were talking about temperature. I wish I had a little cursor here. Uh, uh, can you guys see my cursor there? Yes, we can see that moving. Okay, okay, good. Okay. Um, if you move to the left, let's say this is your typical summer day here, up here around the peak. This is up in your 90s here. See, this would be 98 degrees right in here. We're about the peak of summer annual growth, uh, growth rate in July and August. But we're well past the peak for the cool season grasses. We're, we're over here. You know, it's just basically stopped growing. What we're doing when we put those summer annuals in is we create a cooler microclimate. If you were to crawl in underneath that, instead of being 100 degrees up here, we're, over, we're back here, maybe 20 degrees cooler. And you can see we're back into the temperature range that those cool season grasses find comfortable. They can thrive in. Now, there may only be half the sunlight, but they will grow better on half the sunlight if it's 20 degrees cooler. Basically what you do by creating that overstory is you are turning a July day into an October day. And those cool season grasses grow more in October with half the sunlight than they do in July with double the sunlight. So um, this is just a way of, of using the, the, our knowledge of physiology and plus, um, you look at, well, I've got some other things here. Um, this is one of the species that we like to stick in those summer annuals. And I like this picture because it shows you, look at how tall that brome is. That brome is over knee high when we stretch those leaves out. And one of the functions that we really like to have cool season grasses fill is fall grazing. Well, what we're trying to do with these summer annuals is add, take advantage of that summer sunlight that the cool season grass isn't making good use of, put it into a form where we can store it for additional fall grazing, like this pumpkin. We put the pumpkin out there, pumpkin photosynthesizes very well during the heat of summer, and then deposits that sunlight in all these little orange packages that provide a source of concentrated energy in the fall. Uh, it's just another uh, look at the same field. And you can see there's some legumes out here, sun hemp, sorghum, which is one of the more photosynthetically efficient. We get sunflowers. We've got some foxtail millet in here. We're putting summer active plants that can be grazed in September, October, and uh, we're usually lacking in pasture. And so this is just a way, uh, the sun hemp is a legume. We've got some forage soybeans, some cow peas in here, but the sun hemp is really what seems to dominate in that sod.
that seems to be one of the more successful species that we use. Because that sun hemp is a legume, it's providing nitrogen. And of course, we talked about how important nitrogen is to cool season grasses. And when you graze this in September, um, you're going to convert all that into manure and urine that can be used for the fall growth cycle of that cool season grass. Now, um, one of the most cussed grasses on the planet is tall fescue. And what's wrong with fescue? And people, uh, a lot of people hate fescue. And most of the reason for that is poor animal performance, but it's not the fescue plant that causes the poor animal performance. See all these little hyphae here? This is basically, this is the hyphae of the endophyte fungus that lives inside Kentucky 31 variety of fescue. This fungus causes the plant to produce toxic alkaloids, make the animals sick, hinders their performance. Um, it's not fatally toxic, but it does reduce your animal performance. Um, it's a vasoconstrictor. It causes the blood vessels to shrink up. That means in the summertime, they can't get rid of body heat. So basically they're running a fever, which makes it really bad when, you know, they're, they're trying to breed in the summertime. And I'll just show you uh, Batesville, Arkansas, 44% calving rate on infected fescue versus 80% on endophyte free. That's a huge difference. Number one predictor of economic performance in a cow herd is rebreeding rate, is, is your calving rate. Um, and of course, animal performance, 82 pounds lighter cows on infected fescue versus endophyte free. Um, this is from Missouri, steer gains on three different types. Look at that. Toxic endophyte, 0 0.73, 0 0.50. You know, we're roughly uh, double or triple the gains by switching to an endophyte free or a novel endophyte. And we'll explain a little bit more about that as we progress here. Uh, poor summer growth, of course, fescue is a cool season grass, so it doesn't grow in the summer but people seem to insist on trying to use it as a summer grass. It's not. And that's why I think it's critically important that we pair fescue and brome. A lot of people have fescue or brome as their entire pasture program. It, they really are not standalone grasses and, and neither is a warm season grass. It is very, very important for profitability to have both in your pasture program. And of course, fescue does need additional nitrogen fertility for optimal growth because it is a cool season grass and it's actually very high in protein at certain times. Why do we have so much fescue if it's bad? Well, one reason is it survives. It, it is a survivor. Um, it takes overgrazing much better than most other cool season grasses. And even when we try to kill it, it comes back a lot of times because we're not killing it correctly. And we'll, we'll hit on that as well. And uh, for some purposes, fescue is the best grass there is. Even the infected fescue is very, is better than almost every other grass out there for one purpose. And that is for stockpiling. And by stockpiling, I mean taking the animals off letting the growth accumulate until late fall or early winter and then grazing, using it as a dedicated winter pasture. And this is an extremely underutilized practice. Why do people not do this more often? Mainly it's because they have it eaten completely off by the time winter comes. Stockpiling fescue is the absolute cheapest method there is to winter cattle. I, I don't know of any other practice that can allow you to carry a cow herd through the winter cheaper 
than stockpile fescue. It's, it's just really hard to beat. How do you stockpile fescue? First of all, you, you don't want to graze that from August 1st until it freezes down. And fescue will basically freeze down at about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Obviously doesn't kill it because it's a perennial, will come back the next year. But when you get a temperature down below 10 Fahrenheit, when you hit single digits, that growth will stop for the growing season. And the quality of this is, is amazing. And uh, you, you'll be shocked when I show you some of these figures, just how good stuff this is. And it is important, if you are wanting to stockpile, you do need that source of fertilizer. And legumes may not be the best source of fertilizer for stockpiling, and we'll hit on that. But this, this is what they call a busy slide, but what I wanna take your, point your attention to, you take a look at this digestibility where I'm moving the cursor, Look at this, even by the next March, February, 57% digestibility. Folks, that would be considered very good. Most grass hay is not this digestible. Look at this crude protein, I mean 11, 12. How many people have analyzed their grass hay for protein and got grass hay this high. Most grass hay is in the, I mean, prairie hay, it's very, very common being the five or 6% protein. Uh, brome hay, a lot of times seven, eight, about as good as it gets. This is better quality, stockpiled fescue is better quality than probably 90% of the grass hay out there. And so this is actually pretty good stuff, especially if animals are allowed to be a little bit selective. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when I said it is important, whoop, you give it a shot of nitrogen. Um, even if you have legumes in the stand, um, most of the natural mineralization of legume-based nitrogen in a pasture ecosystem occurs in spring not as much occurs in the fall. Um, so even if you have a good dose of legumes, you can get a nice response to some applied nitrogen. Now, spraying applied nitrogen really reduces the amount of free nitrogen you'll get out of legumes. August applied nitrogen, not so much. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here is you look at the timing, this bottom is the timing of the nitrogen application. And this is the rate. So 0, 40, 80, 120. You compare, you know, zero pounds of nitrogen. They are, you know, all here around one ton of yield. And the top nitrogen amount applied August 1st is about double the fall growth. And there's not too many things where you can make one production decision and double your yield. So this is a pretty good in fact, I would say that nitrogen fertilization on cool season grasses is far more valuable in fall than it is in spring. Usually we have a surplus of spring growth anyway. Why would we fertilize in spring and create a bigger surplus that we have to do something with? You get more bang for your buck economics wise by fertilizing in fall than you do the spring. And of course, if you have some legumes, that's better yet. So, um, whoop, sorry, I've got a very sensitive keyboard right now. So what do we do if you have endophyte infected fescue? You, you can either learn to deal with it, manage it, or you can kill it and replace it. And we'll talk about both. Okay, first of all, on the fescue endophyte, let's, let's figure out how we're going to live with it. How do we cope with it? Uh, first, we'll talk about avoiding the toxic peak period, dilute it, or neutralize it. And as far as toxicity throughout the year, the worst time, uh, the toxins are highest in late spring when the seed head is developing. So end of May, early June. And the summertime is when the effects are the worst. Of course, it stops growing 
after the seed heads develop. So all summer long, they're not eating new growth on that fescue mostly, they're eating what grew earlier. They're eating the straw, essentially, with seed heads on it. And so this is when you really take a, a hit on your production from fescue. Um, the least harmful time is in the winter. And I've already said the highest and best use of fescue is for stockpiled winter pasture. And I'll show you a graph on that. Um, if you are feeding hay that was cut during seed head development, as it usually is, that hay is often very toxic. Um, and feeding that spring cut hay in the winter time to animals on fescue pasture, which is very common, can cause a lot of problems. Especially if you're trying to, and, and pasturing on fescue in the summer, particularly harmful, if you're trying to breed then. In fact, if the only grass you have is fescue, I would strongly recommend looking at fall calving. Strongly recommend you look at fall calving, not spring calving. It just really coincides with the growth curve and the toxicity curve of fescue. Fall calving, much more successful than spring calving on 100% fescue pasture base. Okay, ergovaline. Ergovaline is the main toxin produced by the, uh, by toxic fescue. Look at this, 20th December, look at how that toxicity content goes down throughout the winter. This is why stockpiling fescue, even if it's endophyte infected fescue, is the by far the best way to utilize it. The toxicity goes down. Now, um, one reason that fescue takes over is because it's not a very palatable grass. Animals seem to understand that it is a, uh, <sighs> it's not good for them. They don't like it very well. So they will eat most other plants out and leave the fescue ungrazed. So it, you know, they graze the fescue last resort. So everything else gets better. Or the fescue gets the best chance to survive. And one way of managing that fescue and to get more diversity is to do a high density grazing and then rotate. And we talked about weeds. Um, people say, well, I, I can't grow legumes in my pasture because I have to spray for weeds. And why do you have weeds? It's a good question. Why do you have weeds? Okay, I'll show you something here. Uh, this is a, a look at some of Doug, Pe uh, Doug Peterson, uh, Missouri NRCS uh, gave me this photo uh, shows his cattle and their uh, high density grazing, 120,000 pounds per acre moved every day. And do you notice, do, do you recognize this species? That is Baldwin ironweed. This is one of those weeds that people spray pastures for. What happened to it? They ate it. So you tell me, if cattle eat a 20 some percent plus protein plant that's higher in calcium and phosphorus than the grass, is it still a weed? If they eat it, why would we want to kill it? Seems to me like the only thing we need to do is change our management so that animals eat it. And you can see there's a lot of feed left on the ground. This is not bare dirt. This is not bare dirt. They weren't starved down to this weed. When you rotationally graze and you move every single day, animal behavior changes, completely changes. So um, the best way, and, and I don't understand why, I just know that it does. And the best analogy I've heard is if you're at the Pizza Hut buffet, and you're there by yourself, you're going to go back and forth and try to pick out whatever you want. Uh, what's the best thing I can eat? 
If, however, you're at the Pizza Hut buffet and you're looking things over and you hear brakes screech and you look outside and it's a school bus carrying the high school football team, you're going to get what you can while you can. And, and the intense grazing with rapid rotation does exactly that. It makes animals non-selective grazers. They eat everything and it's unbelievable. I've seen animals completely eliminate thistle uh, and, and not just musk thistle like we have, nasty African thistles that uh, <laughs> make our musk thistles look uh, pretty puny in comparison. Um, now, we talked about interseeding. I think interseeding is the single, I mean, I, probably the two top things, three top things, management things, interseed, uh, companion species, rotationally graze so that they can be managed and seasonally appropriate grazing focused on fall, spring, or winter, uh, spring and winter, um, depending on whether we're talking broom or fescue. Um, but if you're going to intercede these, there are some caveats and, and we'll talk about these individual species. Uh, Teff grass is something, it's an annual uh, summer annual grass will help pick up the summer productivity, um, establishes fairly well broadcast. Um, crabgrass, another uh, reseeding summer annual, uh, crabgrass is a reseeding summer annual grass. Teff needs to be seeded every year. Crabgrass seems to reseed no matter how hard you graze it. F seems to not recede, no matter how hard you graze it. Depending on your goals, one or the other might be a better choice for you. And of course, the idea behind getting a lot of these legumes out there, legumes, other grasses, is to dilute the toxins with the fescue. This is just a study uh, down in Arkansas, where the diluted fescue with Bermuda grass, stalker steers gained an extra 52 pounds. Even though Bermuda grass is not the greatest quality grass, it's better than fescue in the summertime. But if you had the same percentages, 50% Bermuda and 50% fescue, but the fescue is endophyte free, they gain 10 or gain 17% more. So you're diluting the effects, you're not negating the effects, but we will talk about methods to negate the effects. One of the ways to negate the effects is through your animal genetics. This is a Senepol bull, uh, that's S-E-N-E-P-O-L. This is a, a breed that was derived using some uh, African Nadama genetics um, that these animals have a, a greater ability to dissipate body heat in the summertime. And so, um, they also have a, a suberin wax that tends to reflect infrared light. So they don't heat up out in the sunlight like uh, most animals do. And of course the red hide helps. These animals don't seem to suffer at all from fescue toxicity. So if you're in fescue country, Eastern Kansas, Southeast Kansas, uh, Missouri, um, this could be really beneficial. Saponins. Saponins are the protein in legumes that cause the frothy bloat. You say, well, that's bad, but if they also, saponins tend to help neutralize the alkaloids in fescue. Uh, alfalfa and white clover, two of the more prominent saponin containing plants. Um, tannins. Now, tannins are a different type of compound. They are found in a number of plants, uh, annual Lespedeza or Korean Lespedeza. Um, annual Lespedezas would include Korean, Marian, common Lespedeza, or the striate Lespedezas, even Sericea Lespedeza, which is a, a per noxious perennial in Kansas, um, contains a lot of tannin and can help neutralize. The annual Lespedezas uh, are not so high in tannin. Uh, to be unpalatable, they're very palatable actually, the annual Lespedezas, but contain enough tannin to neutralize that alkaloid. Very beneficial to have an annual Lespedeza in a fescue. Sanfoin um, is another tannin containing plant. 
um, in chicory. Chicory contains some uh, tannin-like polyphenols that uh, not only um, inactivate fescue alkaloids, um, tannins also have the effect of neutralizing bloat-causing compounds uh, like the saponins, and uh, they help inter expel internal parasites. Now, how do you get things going? I think one of the most important things is don't over apply nitrogen fertilizer in the spring. If you want legumes, do not apply nitrogen fertilizer in spring. Just don't. Count on your legumes to carry the load. Okay. Um, make sure you test your pH. Most cool season grasses that have received nitrogen fertilizer, every pound of nitrogen fertilizer you apply will create a need for two pounds of lime to neutralize it. And that's all concentrated right at the soil surface. So um, take a one inch soil sample and test it for pH. Sometimes it's shocking how low. Uh, we had, uh, when I was in grad school at K-State, we sampled surface inch of some uh, brome waterways that had been fertilized since the 50s. And they were pH four you will not get clover to start in that. But it only takes, when you sample that, it only takes a small amount of lime to neutralize that top inch. You know, it's one sixth of whatever the soil test says. So it may not be very expensive, but it could be very beneficial to neutralize that top inch. Another problem I've run into is crickets. Crickets just decimate new seedlings. Um, it may be necessary to take measures to neutralize crickets. And of course, we've talked about rotational grazing. Grasses are much more tolerant of continuous grazing than legumes are, other, other than white clover. White clover will tolerate continuous grazing. Most legumes don't. They really need rotational grazing in order to thrive. They can be grazed close, but not often. And so um, they need that rest period. Now, the other step is, is that we can do is to kill fescue. How do you kill that fescue? There, there is a procedure. A lot of people have sprayed fescue out and went in and planted endophyte free fescue or novel endophyte fescue and went right back. Then their pastures are toxic again and they don't, what happened? Well, folks, you're planting 20 pounds an acre of new seed and there's 400 pounds an acre of old seed in the ground. What do you think is going to win? Hey, if you want to eliminate a fescue stand, there, there are some rules that you need to follow. And, and this is a little bit more involved than what we've been led to believe in the past. So again, this is my opinion. This is what I recommend. So uh, you can take it for what it's worth, but it's been very successful with people I've worked with. First of all, you want to prevent the fescue from making seed. So, so clipping it uh, can be very useful. Um, don't let it produce seed. You want to reduce, eventually, we want to plant a new stand of grass with no viable fescue seed in the ground. Now, this is important. Fescue seed has a maximum longevity of about two years. The endophyte fungus lives less longer, or I don't know, is that the proper term, less longer? It is not as long lived as the seed itself. So your goal is to prevent any fescue seed from, you, you want to prevent any fescue that comes up within that time period from, from establishing. So you need two years out of that fescue. So spraying with glyphosate, you can till. I'm not a tillage fan. I think it's horrible for soil health. I, I think glyphosate is less detrimental than tillage. Um, they're both necessary evils for getting rid of, of, of uh, endophyte fungus. Um, fescue is most susceptible to Roundup in the fall. Um, Sometimes it's easiest logistically to spray the fescue in the spring when it, it's uh, most productive because you get usually in the spring you have plenty of other pasture. So, um, and then after you spray it, plant a smother crop. Now, this is some Roundup Ready soybeans. 
It can be, which enables you to control some pasture weeds and forms a tight canopy that can really just kind of kill everything out. Uh, you can plant a grain crop or you can plant a pasture crop. And then every spring, sometime within there, before any fescue seedlings produce seed again, get established, produce seed, keep hitting it with Roundup. Your goal is no fescue plants allowed to establish for two years. Once you go two years with no infected fescue seedlings allowed to develop, number one, you're probably going to be out of fescue, period. Number two, if you do get an odd fescue plant that does live longer than two years, um, it's going to be in the fight free, almost certainly. Now, people say, well, I can't let my pasture sit for two years growing nothing. It's not sitting two years and growing nothing. You can plant annual pastures. Have you ever seen a fescue pasture produce this much biomass in summer? Um, you won't see it. People tell me that during this conversion process, and please don't try to convert all your acres at once. You don't need to. Think 20%, 10%. Start small and start converting. People tell me that once they see how these an annual pastures perform and how well their animals perform on them, it's like, why didn't we do this a long time ago? It's not like you sacrifice money for an eventual goal of better pastures. You get better pastures as soon as you plant these annuals out there. And then you can follow those summer annuals with winter annuals. These are winter annuals that were drilled right in to a grazed off patch of sorghum sedan. You can see the sorghum sedan that's growing back. You don't need to round up it. The only time you need to round up in this process is really in the spring every year to keep any fescue seedlings from producing seed. You know, kill any fescue seedlings that come up before they're allowed to produce seed. And long-term, uh, if you're, when you think about planting something back after you've killed that fescue, uh, most people find it most successful to have part of their acreage in warm season grass, part in cool season grass, and part in annuals. And, um, the cool season grass, of course, uh, if you want to go back with fescue, and I think fescue is a great option as long as it's a novel endophyte fescue, one we carry is called Estancia. And there are a number of fescue options out there, novel endophytes. Uh, uh, there's E34 plus, um, Estancia is one, Texoma is one. Um, those are all excellent choices. They're all good. They are slightly different. Uh, each of them has a little higher utility for some purposes than others. Uh, one thing that I do like about Estancia is it has a high magnesium content, uh, which is important for preventing grass death. Um, now, warm season grasses. Why should you have some warm season grasses in your program? If you look at this, it's pounds of gain per acre. The graph on the left over here shows fescue by itself. Fescue spring grazed, summer grazed, and fall grazed. About 250 pounds of beef per acre. And probably took a lot of nitrogen to do that. When you put the warm season grass, big blue stem or gamma grass in, look at how many more pounds per acre that you're producing. About 75, 80 more pounds an acre here. And Look at this, almost double the amount here. Um, big blue stem here, obviously very productive in the summertime. Look at that. You don't see fescue producing that green in August. Now this is probably September actually, looking at what that is. That's a lot of biomass. And I uh, wanted to show you, this is orchard grass, a cool season grass in the, uh, June of 2018, after getting only an inch of rain a month for the pre previous 13 months. This is Eastern Gamma grass, same day, about 100 yards away. Warm season grass versus cool season grass.
Dual season grass is extremely valuable for spring and fall. Don't rely on them for summer grazing. For summer grazing, have a warm season grass. And warm season grasses have a reputation for being hard to establish and I'm kind of encroaching on a future webinar here. I guess I'm giving you a sneak preview, but um, one of the keys to establishing warm season grass is mycorrhizal fungi. To the left over here, this was inoculated with mycorrhizal fungi. From here over was not. What a difference mycorrhizal inoculation makes on a warm season grass. Not that dramatic on cool season grass, but it definitely is on warm season grass. And this is some Eastern gamma grass that's being established at the same time that a corn crop is being grown on the land. You know, one of the objections to establishing pasture is that you have to let it sit for a whole full year without using it. Well, what if you didn't, you could make money. What if you could make money during that establishment period? That removes one more barrier to establishing grass. This corn crop, this grass did not hurt this corn crop a bit. And imagine that how good of a stock grazing quality you would have with not only the corn residue, but this grass underneath it. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna close down. I do have a couple of books on the market if you are interested in obtaining either of these books, uh, just let me know. Um, got uh, my email and phone number there if you're interested, and I think we'll uh, open it up for questions. Okay, very good, Dale. Um, we have a question here from Joe. He says, when is the best time to plant annuals in brome. So I'm assuming like those uh, warm season annuals you were showing into the brome. Good question. Yeah. Um, and timing is very important. Um, you know, on prepared ground in, you know, Kansas, I usually say the best time to plant summer annuals is, you know, end of May, end of May early June. When you're going into that brome or fescue sod, the brome is still pretty competitive um, up to about mid-June. Once it begins its typical brownout period, that's the time to put those summer annuals out there. If you go too early, the, the, the brome just takes it over. Uh, it's too competitive. And it really works best to kind of peel that. I'm not a big fan of grazing things cool season grasses down very hard. Uh, but if you want to put summer annuals out there, that is a time to do it. You know, take that canopy off. You want to leave just a little bit for soil protection for a mulch after it browns out. But you don't want it so thick that those seedlings have a hard time getting sunlight. So uh, the last two weeks of June are probably prime time in the state of Kansas. Usually, that's when it starts getting hot, but we're usually still getting some rain. If you wait too late on into July, your odds of catching rain are really diminished. And it obviously, you, you're having two sets of plants use the water. And the perennial plants have an established root system. So they're gonna be more competitive for that water. Um, it does take rain to make that practice work. work. It, it's, it's not a slam dunk. It doesn't happen every year. But, uh, you know, I, I've been piddling around with it for five or more years now. Um, and most years, you know, in, in 2018, it was a doggone dry, nothing worked. And, uh, but, you know, every other year, it got good results from it. And when it works, it really works. I mean, it's just yeah. that picture that you showed is just, you know, that's incredible how much production uh, they got. Yeah. And, and, and it's a matter of expectations as well, because if you're expecting the same type of productivity that you'll get from those same species, you know, we had, you know, I showed you a picture of three or four foot tall sun hemp. You plant sun hemp on 
you know, crop ground with a burned down herbicide, you know, it might get eight or 10 foot tall. And uh, so, you know, that's half the productivity of prepared crop ground. But you compare it to the brome without that, I mean, that might be four inches tall instead of four feet tall. Yeah. So, Dale, you mentioned sun hemp, and I think you maybe mentioned sorghum and sedan. What, what are some other annuals that you would plant into either a brome or fescue in that time frame? It depends a lot on whether I'm, uh, usually when I'm planting summer annuals out there, it's with the, the intent to enhance the fall or the winter grazing of that cool season grass. Um, our cowpeas have been successful. Um, sorghums, now one problem with sorghum is if you are grazing sorghum during the time of frost in the fall, um, you've got a risk of prussic acid. So if you are intending to graze during time of frost risk, which is usually October in Kansas, um, you might want to have either some, some cool season grass without summer annuals, in, without sorghum in it. Um, you know, either hasn't had summer annuals at all drilled in it or a sorghum free mix in it. Uh, sorghum is probably the single most impressive plant I've seen in sod seeding, probably followed by sun hemp. And the sorghum variety that just seems to work so much better than the others is, is uh, Egyptian wheat. Um, that is, and Egyptian wheat is not a wheat, it's a sorghum. It's kind of confusing, but it's a, an old open pollinated hard seeded sorghum that just is tough. It's not the greatest forage quality, but it works. Yeah. Um, about uh, like sunflowers, buckwheat, some of those yes. types. Yes. Sunflowers, buckwheat, okra has worked pretty well. Um, had good luck with brown top millet. Um, I've tried corn. I wish corn worked, you know, like BMR corn. Just haven't had good luck with it. Um, I, I don't know if it's because it needs a little better seed bed than you can get in a sod. Um, but actually, uh, if, if you got some leftover corn seed, you know, some old pot bags or broken bags that, you know, that can't be sold, every seed dealer has some, throw it in the drill. Get, soybean. At least throw get it. rid of it. If it's free, use it. But don't, don't use it as a standalone if you're relying on it. You know, mix some things with it. And cow peas and sun hemp really seem to work well. So they are their perennial planting options rather than or in addition to those annual plantings in Brome or do those just take too long to establish and you about have to use the annuals? Uh, oh yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mentioned um, the clovers. Uh, as far as, you know, like that Brome fixing mix, uh, those are almost all perennials. Red clover, alfalfa, uh, if you want to put in alfalfa in, I make sure you commit to rotational grazing and bloat control. Uh, but if you're willing to do those two things, alfalfa, you know, alfalfa is best grazing plant there is, except for two problems. It kills your animals and your animals kill it. If you can manage to avoid those two things, and, and the management is not that difficult. It's not that complex. There's half a dozen guidelines you need to follow, but if you rotationally graze with appropriate rest periods and, and use bloat control, alfalfa can absolutely double the productivity of just about every yeah. rescue pest. So, so let me ask you this. If somebody has a brome or a, you know, fescue or even, you know, orchard grass, any of those cool season grass pastures, what does the timing look like on trying to get alfalfa, red clover, trefoil? Okay. Because I'm not going to do that at the end of June like those annuals. When's right, the yeah. To establish those? Another good question. Um, and thank you. That That's something I omitted and, and should have had in there. There's really two windows. Um, right now, you know, right around the 1st of September is is one of the windows. So this, this is an opportunity. Um, if you're going to put it in this time of year, I would drill it in. 
the other window, I, I guess if you're going to drill those in, um, early September, early April are your, probably your two best windows. Another, um, another window of opportunity um, is in the middle of winter. The advantage of doing things in the middle of winter is you can broadcast seed and the freeze thaw cycles that, that uh, call it cryoturbation, the, the freezing and thawing that, that work that soil, kind of churn it up, will cover your seed up very effectively. That's honestly what most people do. They'll frost seed, uh, red and white clover and uh, Korean lespedes are very commonly frost seeded. But plantain and chicory are great additions, cool season pastures. Can alfalfa be frost seeded too? Alfalfa does not frost seed as well as the clovers. Um, you'll get some establishment and uh, people consider alfalfa a really expensive plant to establish. Um, if you're planting it in a pure stand, putting 20 pounds an acre out there, yeah, it's expensive. But in a pasture situation, it is amazing how much productivity you can get out of just one or two pounds of alfalfa an acre. You, you don't need a lot. In fact, you don't want a lot. Yeah. One or two pounds is, is God's plenty. And uh, you're not talking a lot of money there. Yeah, thank you, Dale. It's a lot of good information. Folks, if you have questions, you can uh, email Dale or tune in next week. And uh, Dale, do you know what the, I, I don't know. What is the topic for next week? Do you want to give us a preview there? Um, I, uh, I believe we are talking about uh, native grass okay. next week. So. Okay. Well, folks, thank you. If you have other people that you think should watch this, it is being recorded, and the good folks over at Kansas Grazing Lands will be getting it up uh, on YouTube uh, for people to watch, and we'll send that link out. So thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, Thanks, have, a folks. Good have a great uh, Labor Day weekend. Thank you, Dale.